folks, let's uh, call this meeting to order. I uh, appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, this is a regularly scheduled and called Greer City Council meeting called and convened April 12th, 2020. Having uh, called the meeting to order, I would like to ask you, if you would, to stand and uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance and then the invocation. We have Troop 41 with us this evening. They are Boy Scouts representing the uh, Zor Methodist Church, and uh, Steve Marks is their, uh, their leader. The boys are here and are going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Fellas, the floor is yours. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, we uh, come before you humbly this evening and uh, ask your blessings upon these proceedings. We uh, thank you for those that have uh, joined us and uh, ask that uh, you bless them as well, too. And uh, in particular, one of our retirees, Mr. Richard Watson, and his family that are here this evening. Uh, we pray a special blessing upon him. Lord, um, you have uh, called us to public service, and uh, we submit to that calling. We ask that uh, you give us insight and understanding to the items and the issues that are in front of us. Give us conviction as well, too, uh, to vote in the best interest of the city as we have been called uh, to represent the city and our representative districts and uh, as a whole. We uh, pray that through the furtherance of this meeting that uh, you'll be with us, that you will guide and direct us in all that's said and done. And we will give you glory for all that's accomplished. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Ms. Duncan, do we have anybody to appear in public forum this evening? No, sir. With that, Council, we will uh, move to the minutes of the Council meeting. Uh, you have in your packet this evening the minutes from the March 22nd, 2020 meeting. I'll entertain a motion that they be received. So moved. Second. We have a motion in a second. Uh, any items of note for the clerk? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Council, we have a special recognition this, uh, this evening. And uh, I am going to ask Mr. Richard Watson, if he would, to join us in the front.
somebody that is going to take his place on that team, that there will be no one that will take your place. <laughs> uh, and with that, I offer this certificate of appreciation. And it reads as such, congratulations upon your retirement from the city of Greer. Presented in appreciation for 22 years of dedicated service to the city of Greer. November 11, 1999, March 30, 2020. Richard Watson, you in this day, the 12th of April. others better by their presence. There are some people that make the world a better place, and uh, Richard is one of those that makes the world a better place, and we, uh, we appreciate his service to the city of Greer. Mr. Merriman, your report, please, sir. Yes, sir. Mayor, Council, thank you all. Um, give me a few minutes to run through some things. First of all, I want to um, uh, just remind everybody that um, uh, Mr. Stringer, who is uh, represented the city of Greer for a number of years, um, was honored today, and I think honored appropriately by the governor and lieutenant governor, who um, ordered him the uh, or awarded him the order of the Palmetto. So, um, uh, just wanted to remind y'all that that took place here today. We had a great uh, visit with um, uh, some of our delegates from around uh, the Greenville Spartanburg area. Certainly got to catch up with uh, Representative Stringer and the the governor. So. Uh, Congratulations to Representative Stringer, and thank you for your many years of, of work. I uh, <clears throat> want to shout out to our fire department and uh, really the, the city in general. We were awarded this year, um, or at least designated as a fire safe community for 2021. Um, there were 104 departments in the state that were recognized um, as fire safe communities uh, through 36 counties. Uh, we we were able to achieve that uh, through uh, enhanced data collection. Uh, we would do in-home safety visits. Uh, we would attend classes on risk um, uh, risk management and risk coordination through the National Fire Academy. So congratulations to the uh, City of Greer Fire Department and all those that helped uh, the city attain that designation. A couple of reminders. Um, the employee picnic we do every year out here will be on the 29th. That will be the last Friday of the month. Um, and we'd love to uh, have council members, council members present. Um, I think it was back in January I brought to you all um, our vacancy report. And typically I don't do a vacancy report. Um, but what I brought to you then was 41 vacant positions throughout the city, which represented just about 15% of our workforce. Um, and we have focused and focused and focused on rectifying that over the last uh, few months. So uh, with, with department heads actively uh, working hard to, to fill vacancies to um, Alicia and her team and, and human resources, to our folks in finance, I'm proud to say that we now have 30, what did I have, 39 vacancies, but 
23 people in process to fill 23 of the 39 vacancies. So um, we are, we're very excited where we're going with this. So we hope um, we get to a point where we're fully staffed. And to that point, the next thing is in an effort to continue that, we are having a job fair at the Cannon Center on Thursday from 7 to 4. So um, all departments and all um, department heads, or at least a representative from those departments, will be there. There will be an opportunity for on-site interviews for certain open positions. So I would encourage anybody that would like to work for the City of Greer or that knows anybody that would like to work for the City of Greer to attend the job fair to learn a little bit more about what we do and how we operate um, and have a chance to uh, visit with some of our folks. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us. And then finally, the last thing I do is want to remind you all that after next meeting, and Brandon, correct me because I just thought about this, but after the next meeting, we're going to do the UDO workshop, right? So after your next council meeting, uh, two weeks from tonight, we will um, have a scheduled workshop to go over a number of issues through the UDO process. So just make sure you keep that uh, on your calendars. Uh, unless there's any questions, Mr. Mayor, that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. And let me add to that that uh, we have the uh, Greer Goes Global International Festival coming up Saturday, April the 23rd. That uh, festival is from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to come here to the city park and learn more about our international community. Uh, I was in a conference recently that identified over 500 <laughs> Uh, companies that are located in the upstate that claim uh, their headquarters is outside of the United States, international companies. Uh, and if you uh, do some, uh, just some loose math uh, based on the number of companies that uh, the Greer Development Corp has identified as international, about 13% of those companies are located here in the Greer area. Interesting number uh, as well, too, because we now, as a community, are beginning to approach that number in terms of international residents here within the city as well, too. So a, uh, a good time to uh, better understand, literally, who our neighbors are and uh, also to uh, sample great food, uh, lots and lots of kids' activities at this particular festival. Uh, there's uh, opportunities for face painting and uh, henna uh, applications and uh, lots of interactive things for the children to do. I would urge you to, uh, to visit the Greer Goes International Festival that will be coming up soon here at City Park. With that, Council, let's move to uh, items of old business before you this evening. You'll find those listed. First item of old business this evening is the second and final reading of Ordinance Number 4-2022. This is an ordinance to provide for the annexation of property owned by Pac Divine. This uh, ordinance and the one following that have uh, both been withdrawn from uh, the items of business tonight and I believe we'll come back up at our next meeting if that's uh, correct. Uh, Mr. McMahon? Yes, that is correct. The, uh, the applicant has withdrawn or asked the motion to be tabled for this evening. Okay, thank you. With that then, we'll move on to uh, item three since the first two are interrelated. Uh, second reading uh, occurs for ordinance number 13-2022. This is an ordinance to provide for the annexation of property owned by Column GSP at 081 LP, located at 1296 Woods Chapel Road by 100% petition and established a zoning classification of I-1 for said property. Mr. McMahon, any new or additional information in that regard? Yes, sir. Planning Commission did hold a public hearing on March 21st, and they do make a recommendation of approval of the I-1 zoning. Comes with an it comes with a recommendation for approval. Um, I'll entertain a motion to receive. Second. And second. Floor is open for discussion. Questions? Comments? <clears throat> Hearing none. Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Item four is the second and final reading of ordinance number 14-2022. This is an ordinance to change the zoning classification of a property and portion of other properties 
owned by 296 at Kist Road, LLC, located on Highway 101, <coughs> Kist Road and Highway 296 from C3 to RM2. <coughs> Any new or additional information in regards to Ordinance Number 14-2022? Yes, sir. Planning Commission held a public meeting in February, and they do make a recommendation of approval of the RM2 multifamily zone. Comes with a recommendation from uh, Zoning Commission. Do I hear a motion to receive? So moved. <coughs> and a second. Yeah. Floor is open for discussion. <coughs> Comments? <coughs> Questions? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Let's move to items of new business. The first one is a bit of summary in regards to the Cannon Center deck renovation project. Mr. Merriman, I believe you've got an update on that project. I do, Mr. Mayor. I would ask that um, this, this item um, be removed from the agenda for this evening. Um, we have found that the project actually needs to be rebid, so we will be going through that process, hopefully bringing it back to council for your consideration uh, soon. Would it be appropriate to have a bid to hold this over or to uh, table it? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would, in this particular case, table it because <clears throat> okay. I don't know when I'd bring it back. I'll entertain a motion that a uh, bid summary for the Cannon Center deck renovation project uh, be tabled. So moved. And a second? Second. Any discussion in that regard? <sighs> Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Mr. Merriman, in regards to old business, second and final reading of ordinance number 4-2022 and second and final reading of ordinance number 5-2022, I know that uh, it was a request of uh, the developer that brings us to this point. Uh, would it be uh, prudent for us to go back and to um, hold those items over by um, vote? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I believe in this situation a vote is going to be the safest thing to do. Council, let's back up just a minute. Uh, at the request of the developer, second and final reading of ordinance number 4-2022 is asked to be held over. I'll entertain a motion that uh, that be uh, made. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any questions in that regard? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Second and final reading of ordinance number 5-2022. Uh, at the request of the developer, this has been uh, asked to be removed from the council uh, agenda tonight and held over. I'll entertain a motion in that regard. So moved. Second. Uh, any questions in that regard? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Council, thank you. I think that cleans this up just a bit as we move forward. Second item before us this evening is the bid summary for the Victor Jim parking lot repaving project. Uh, um, based on information that uh, I received today uh, from Mr. Merriman, I think it would be appropriate that we hold this uh, matter over as well, too. Do you concur, Mr. Merriman? I do. Thank you, Mayor. With that, then, I'll entertain a motion that this project, Victor Jim parking lot repaving project, be held over. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments, questions in that regard? Further information will be coming. Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes, moving along. Item three, project management software approval. Um, as you can see there in your packet, there is a description of a management project regarding software. Uh, Mr. Guggenhauer will join us for that uh, description and uh, an overview of the work. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, thank you for giving me some time to speak. 
Uh, as your project manager, uh, I've been here a little over nine months now, and I've had a little bit of time to get my feet wet. Uh, I've seen some of the challenges that uh, we have with projects, and I think I have some pretty good ideas of where we need, where we can start uh, to get our ha hands wrapped around the large number that are coming our way. Uh, and it all starts with one, the first step, and I think that's going to be with, with getting a defined process in place. Um, when I worked as a project manager for Tyndall and uh, Department of Defense and so forth, they had defined processes already in place uh, that I could follow. Um, and at Tyndall, in fact, we use pretty much just the Excel sheet to, to manage our projects, which is not ideal. Um, uh, however, when I did work with Tyndall, a lot of our clients and, and general contractors utilized a, a software package called Procore. And, and a lot of people are familiar with that. It's very big in the construction industry. It works very well to keep everybody in, in one version of truth, uh, align tasks, and, and make sure everybody has information when they need it. It's, uh, it's a great project management tool and software, but it's not ideal for what we need here at the city. Um, we, look, we even looked at it and assessed it with the team uh, in the city, and uh, it, it just doesn't fit our needs. But what we did finalize on and pick was a, a software called Arigo. It's run through AutoCAD, AutoCAD uh, services it. It's, it's a, a, a very good tool, and it is built for government entities and situations where either government entities, municipalities uh, can utilize it. And our, it, it's intuitive. It's easy to use. It's something that can be configured. Uh, so we're really excited about it. And uh, you've got the uh, pretty much the breakdown of it in your packet. If you have any questions, I hope the team uh, uh, agrees with us and the, and the council let us go forward on that software package. Council, you've heard the recommendation of our facilities manager. I'll entertain a motion to receive for the purpose of discussion. So, uh, we've got a motion in a second. Floor is open for discussion. The only heartburn I have with it is that you're paying for it every two years all over again. Sorry. The general cost, thirty-some thousand, and then what you're paying yearly after that, you're buying it again every two years. Yes, sir. All, all That's these, a lot of support money. Well, yeah, a lot of these pay. This is actually about half the cost of what typical packages cost yearly on the yearly uh, fees. Uh, that thirty some thousand it does get you the onboarding that includes all the training for staff helps them actually get it loaded onto all all of our systems and integrated with uh, currently what with what we've got which is pretty much uh, the one piece that we may be able to, to hit, hitch onto or, or function with is cartograph uh, there's been some discussions of, of how we can utilize some of the information coming out of cartograph to feed into our project management software, so some compatibility is there. Uh, so part of that 10,000 uh, onboarding would help us to determine that and figure out how to train us on on those pieces. Um, but yes, there is there's a yearly cost. Sure. <laughs> I'm curious. We may not have been able to be this specific with data, but have we thought about or an estimate of an economic value of what we as an organization are losing, not having the efficiency of that streamlined system that hopefully this will bring online and pay for itself? I, I think the two projects we just went through prior to this will be a good example of how that might save us. The information that this will encapsulate and allow us to maybe sidestep a lot of these issues where we're double working, we're triple working. Uh, yes, sir. It, 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 there's not been a study done, but it will inevitably save us time and money in the long run. And I think it's well worth it. So it's your belief expense. and staff's belief that the cost will be more than paid for in recovered efficiency in what we're trying to do? Yes, sir. Uh, we will, just by tabling one of our projects this evening, uh, and, and there are it, way right now in our current environment, when we sidestep something, the the project, knowing it's coming on down the future anyway, is going to just the uh, cost of inflation 
if we could we can tackle some of these problems up front and get these projects nailed down the way they need, you know, so we can move forward on them when we want to, I think, yes, to your point, will save us in the long run. I think it'll pay for itself. Yes, I do. Several Others. times over. Others? Comments? Ms. Duncan. Mr. Earwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? No. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Thank you, sir. First reading of the ordinance number 15, 2022. This is an ordinance to change the zoning classification of property owned by Banco Group LLC, located at 3700 Brushy Creek Road from C2 Commercial to RM Residential Multifamily. Mr. McMahon, information in that regard, please, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council. As you stated, this is a request to rezone this parcel. This came before you back in, I believe, February of 2021. Um, what they are requesting is to rezone to RM2 multifamily. Here's an overview of the area. Here's the current zoning, showing the property as C2. Future land use map, this property is designated for a traditional neighborhood community. Um, this is kind of a current picture up at the top of the white. What he has done so far has done some exterior work to change the appearance of the building. Planning Commission did hold a public hearing for this request on the 21st of March, and they did make a recommendation of approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, sir. Council comes with a uh, recommendation for approval. I'll entertain a motion for the purpose of discussion. So Floor is open for discussion. So my recollection of this was he had some pretty big obstacles and he's overcoming those? Yes, sir. He has submitted for building permits to start some of the work. Um, the parking will be the issue that he is going to have to get kind of fixed in the end. Um, the structure is going to be non-conforming due to the right-of-way issue with it being there. So the parking will have to kind of go behind the property, and they'll be required to have two parking spaces per unit. And remind me again, this is how many? This is two units? Yes, sir. It's two studio units. Top and bottom. Top and bottom. Yes, sir. Approximately how many hundred? How many square feet? Four to five hundred per unit, I believe. What was the, the big rub last time with this? We just didn't think that it. I think I remember the conversation was it just didn't fit or didn't didn't seem to fit the intended use of the building in, in the corner. Council did re request some elevations. The applicant did supply those, but I'm not sure what, what the final deciding factor was. It looks nice. He's done a good job of fixing it up from the exterior. I haven't seen it inside, but my wife got it okay. I think the issue was that <clears throat> Maybe we could ask about what they felt like the, the rental rate would be. And I don't think council thought that. I, I don't know. That's, I think at least my concern was we don't want to do any, we don't want to approve anything that will uh, be a detriment. Well, not a detriment, but just it, it, it doesn't do anything to elevate the community. That's what I think the concern was last time. And that's why we had asked for some elevations and things like that. Mr. McMahon, you said the parking would be in the rear of the building is, is you know, there appears to be, I think I recall, gravel and parking in the front when it used to be the hot dog stand or whatever it was. Um, is uh, is there anything that would uh, preclude or prevent them from just parking in the front of this building? There, there's really not. Um, we would just make them actually designate parking in the back, but they would be able to park pretty much anywhere on the property. Well, that's true of any house. Yes, sir. You park in front yard anywhere. Now, um, and I'm, this is more of a building code. 
does any of that, any of the accessibility, does it have to comply on both floors or just, or how, how is that? I don't believe with residential it has to comply. I believe once you kind of get into maybe a triplex or a quadplex, I believe that's when it kind of hits kind of commercial requirements. I don't believe residential requires ADA. Did I understand you to say that it's going to be used as one residence now? It will be. They're going to have a, a unit on the top and a unit on the bottom, okay. so it'll be so a. It'll, still go, it'll be a duplex. It's going to be two, like one bedroom studios or something like that. Yes, ma'am. How has the work been completed up until this point? It's, so he submitted permits originally under residential. We denied those, and it came back as commercial permits. Some of the work was completed without permits. I think I recall seeing a stop work order posted out there. Other questions? Comments? Okay. Mr. Airwood. This is our first reading, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Mr. Hopper. No. Mr. Dumas. No. Mr. Bettis. Yes. Ms. Albert. Yes. Mayor Danner. No. Second item before us this evening is first reading of ordinance number 17-2022. This is an ordinance to change the zoning classification of property owned by residents, developers, LLC, located on Snow Road from R12 to DRD. Mr. McMahon, information in that regard? Yes, sir. This property was originally approved as an R12 subdivision they've received preliminary approval and a grading permit and they are actively grading the site they have recently come back and asked to kind of relay the site out have some single family detached in the front and some townhomes in the back so here's an aerial view of the property this is off of snow road the other road kind of adjacent to this is burns road here's the current zoning map the majority of the property out there is zoned either r10 or r12 Here's the future land use map. This was not intended since it is Snow Road, but this was the, <laughs> the picture that we had. Um, yeah. so, but here, here is a layout of the subdivision that they're kind of proposing. Um, so it's going to kind of come in with a single family detached and then kind of transition into the townhomes. Within the statement of intent, they kind of listed kind of their typical materials. What they did ask for in the statement of intent is for shake siding, vinyl siding, stone veneer, stylish garage doors and dormers. Planning Commission did hold a public hearing on this. They did make a recommendation of approval with the condition that the vinyl siding material be removed from the statement of intent and the addition of hardy board, brick and, brick and or stone be added with the requirement of combination of two materials. It's all the information I have, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. By show of hands, is the owner of the property or representative of the owner of the property with us this evening? Thank you. Uh, I didn't take a motion of his. Um, Motion to receive. So moved. Second. Floor is open for discussion. This is just a point of for clarification for future. If under, um, for instance, you've got the under building materials and it lists out what they had originally proposed, if we could strike words that say stylish. Um, that doesn't. It doesn't help me. It's very subjective. If if we if if the if uh, for in this instance a garage door is going to be installed and it's something different, then the description would be really good. Yes, sir. Yeah, capital S. Yes. Well, I know. <laughs> I mean, I 
brothers. When these plans are approved for these, who actually follows up to see that all the plans are that, that would be Ashley and myself. Every single residential permit that is submitted, we review. Um, and when they submit them, if they don't list the materials, we ask for that. And if it doesn't comply, they will not get a permit. I know I've heard a couple of comments recently from different subdivisions saying, you know, they promised this and you promised that, but it didn't happen. You know, so, yeah. I didn't know if you followed up to see that everything came through. And some of those subdivisions, if they're a DRD, then that's one thing. But if it's a straight zoning, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't, the developer may have over-promised and under-delivered, but it's not anything that the city would have been able to regulate. If it's, that's right, that's right, that's right. curiosity I, that we'd receive I'm sure council received several emails and calls I don't think it was specific to this project but I think there was some concern there may be blasting on some of these sites and it's not specific to this one I believe it's the other that maybe got tabled tonight what type of follow-up do we do on that or or investigation or um, responsibility or liability do we have if the developer goes out and does something like that and adjacent properties move or shift or how, how does that play into that? That falls completely on the developer. The city has no liability in that, and that's part of their development process. They, they have insurance that covers those type of issues. And when they present their proposal, do they need to know whether they're going to drill or not drill and blast? Most developers do have due diligence, and they, they get through that process. They core the site to make sure if they've got rock and stuff like that. So a lot of them have that knowledge up front, and if they do, they might lay their site out differently. Um, but if they do have to blast, we, we have asked the city attorney this question. It is the liability between the developer and the adjacent property owners. I feel like that's something that should be brought up or should be relevant to the construction due to the surrounding homes around it. There's the end. Well, so, sometimes you don't know that there's what it, you know, what's underneath. It's, it, although they, they go in and they'll take core samples, they may just miss it completely because they're not doing every square foot. And generally, it's been my experience <coughs> excuse me, that the blasting is not what we probably typically have in our mind. Um, it's more of something you'd never notice, but in some cases it, it is. But it, <coughs> I don't think it's what a lot of people think that having a rock quarry because I don't believe it's like that because that's pretty major. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here again, I had a lady say that they blasted back behind, behind her home and it's really jarring the house and uh, messing up some of the foundation. So. This is out from that. But I believe there's more stuff. hand is the snow road development. Any further comments or questions in that regard? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. <clears throat> Mayor Danner? Yes. Council, when I asked if we pause at this point in time, is a representative or owner of the property in regards to ordinance number 15-2022 here this evening. This is the piece of property that we formally discussed at 3700 Brushy Creek Road. By show of hand, is there anyone here in that regard? Okay. Given that the owner of the property is here and was not recognized, Ms. Duncan, what was the count on the vote for the ordinance number 15-2022? Three and three. In a matter of a tie, um, someone in the prevailing party in the same meeting can recall a vote on a particular ordinance. 
since I did not recognize the owner in regards to his ability to speak to this, I'm going to ask council to consider that we recall the vote, the first reading of ordinance number 15-2022 so that we can allow the owner of the property to address council. And I believe that procedurally the prevailing party would have been Mr. Hopper, Mr. Dumas, or yourself. And I believe the motion, if council so decides, should come from Mr. Hopper, Mr. Dumas. So I would ask um, a member of the prevailing party if they would to um, ask for a reconsideration of first reading of ordinance number 15 2022. So motion. And we would need a second. Second. Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood left the room. Do you want to wait out. for him to return? We've got a quorum. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Mr. Airwood, on a uh, procedural oversight by myself in regards to the first reading of Ordinance Number 15-2022, uh, I have asked that uh, the prevailing group uh, recall the question. Uh, that motion in second took place and a vote was affirmative to reconsider the first reading of ordinance number 15-2022. The owner or representative of the owner of the property is with us this evening and I neglected to give him an opportunity to address council. Brandon Matmahan has given us an overview of the ordinance to change the zoning classification of property owned by Banco Group LLC located at 3700 Brushy Creek Road from C2 to RM2. Um, with that then, by show of hand, is the owner of the property with us this evening? If you would, sir, please come to the podium and give us your name and uh, address and we will entertain any comments that you might have in regards to this rezoning, sir. All right, thank you for reconsidering. Um, my name is Nathan Copenin, and uh, I stay at 1400 Daventry Circle in Greer. Um, and this is a piece of property that I've purchased, and um, and it was zoned. It's been it's it's been tried as a commercial piece for a long time, and I know just from the previous owners that uh, retail just a huge problem was parking. That's uh, one of the things that we're talking about for um, that we're solving that being make it turning it into a residential because the cars are you're going to have you know basically two cars and they're going to be coming and going a couple times a day rather than trying to keep a retail uh, establishment going where cars are constantly rotating and that sort of thing. So we um, that's that was our intent on on turning it into a residential property for that reason right there. Um, I mean, I have the ability, I am a general contractor, so I have the ability to make it into commercial or residential, but we just felt like this would be a better better suited for that area to have it residential so that the, par that the uh, traffic is limited. So that's that's the whole intent behind it. Our, our, uh, from the picture there, you can see we had just got started as far as on the exterior. Um, so we're going to bring everything up to, we're going to pave the entire area where it's going to be parking. The park, I, uh, the question was asked, could we put all the parking on the top? And the answer is yes, but it's, it's going to be better suited for us to put a driveway going down the right hand side of the property and put parking on the back side for that. And then we'll just uh, dress it up with landscaping going up against as far as we can into the right of way going up against Brushy Creek Road. So okay. that's the intent there. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. With that, then let's uh, reconsider uh, first reading of ordinance number 15 2022. I'll entertain a motion to receive. Second. And a second. Floor is open for discussion <clears throat> at this point. What is the height of the ceiling in the basement of this, of this unit? It is. Uh, it is right at eight feet. It's seven foot eleven. Is what it is right now. When we put the sheetrock on there, it'll be probably seven ten. Yeah. And is this an efficiency kitchen in in this unit or yes. units? Yes. Yes. Yeah. There'll be. Um, so it's it's um, 
basically a studio, but we will put a wall for a bedroom. That it'll just be a smaller bedroom, um, and and then it'll be kitchen, eating area, and living room all in the basically in the front area, and then just a single bathroom. But it'll be a full bathroom. It'll have, you know, have a tub shower combo, and it'll be a full bathroom. But it'll just be a you know kind of more more of a condensed area. It's just not going to have a lot of the extra space. Footage of each of the units? It's uh, 450 square feet for each. Well, actually, the, bo the bottom floor is a little bit less because of the block. It's a it's a uh, block, so the bottom floor is probably closer to 400, and the top's right at 450. My concern, and it always has been, is that um, you w will not get the rent that you, I think, the, the, that's desired. So therefore, the market drives you down, and then I guess what I'm getting, try, getting around to say, if you go up Buncombe Street, there's new homes that's been built, and there's people redoing um, old homes, and we don't want anything to deter or, or, or take away from that. So, um, you know, I ended up, the, the last vote, I did vote yes, but... I, let me ask this question. Did did I see a stop work order posted on the Yeah. Day? Yeah. That that was um what we were doing is we were doing the exterior, um, just the exterior uh, uh residing and the and the re um re shingling of that. And um we hadn't the our our uh, permit hadn't gone through yet is and that we, we had already started on that. And so there was a stop work order. And um Okay. That's what ended up happening, yeah. And I'm I'm sure that that our our building officials they they'll you, know, you you'll they will make sure things are done that, that protects your tenants. Yeah, can I speak um, to what your other your uh, first concern on that? As far as like being up, up um, uh, I guess you'd more or less say blending with the neighborhood with what's there, and what what is it what's you know, standing right now, and you can see the direction that we're going with the with the new siding and the new shingles, and we'll we'll um, probably not put a whole new deck on, but with the landscaping and and the uh, the driveways and all, I really think it's going to enhance that little that kind of that little area right there. It's going to turn and it I into. I hope a, that it does. I yeah. Mean, and, and I'm I'm looking to be surprised because yeah, it, it is. It's a uh, it's almost a it's not. A, Entrance, but it almost is an entrance to yeah. the city. Yeah. And so, you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. Yeah, and we're and the the enhancing that we're doing from it, it would I don't know what it would have turned into had it not turned into a, um any kind of a residential thing because it seems to be that everything that goes in there that's retail doesn't make it. Right. Mm hmm. I don't think I have an issue with. I like the changes that you made. And I mm -hmm. think it's architecturally pleasing and sound, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to attract. Obviously, a, a, you're going to hold it's a buy and hold situation. You want to, you want to hang on to this property. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not selling it. I'm not, I'm holding on to it. So either way, if it stays commercial or goes residential, we're going to continue with our our um, improvements and do something with it. Gotcha. I, I think my uh, hesitation is is just making it into two units. I mean, I can see it as a single family house and, and uh, you know, a situation where maybe you had uh, a family upstairs and then maybe the in-laws live downstairs mm -hmm. or something like that. But as far as making it uh, a dedicated place with two separate families living in there, I think that's where my kind of struggle is with it. It's just such a small space. Yeah. So um, the in order to make it a single family, because we did, we did go down that road, um, in order to make it into a single family You'd have to put a stairway in, and with the with, with the limited amount of um, you know space that there is in there, anyways, we 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 even looked at spiral stairways because that you could do it like a four or five foot square, and that would take up less space. But no matter which way we did that, we couldn't make a, a single family make sense. We, that's that's the main reason why we did that because you couldn't take access from the upstairs to down. Right now, there's no access. The only access is with it with its own exterior door. Both of them have it. So you lose a lot of square footage up and down. That's right. Yeah, that's what I mean. 
and even even with a even with a spiral staircase it was a really it's it's already so limited that it just made it that much more limited and so to kind of take advantage of that you're you're looking to just have two dedicated spaces correct gotcha and then what so what is the plan exactly again to get a parking lot or whatever it is you're going to do on that bottom where is the entrance going to be on the bottom is it where that white area is at the bottom of that chimney yes um is and go behind so it drops down really good right here so you've got a lot of cover there but it's pretty flat back in this area can you go back to the building itself okay so right over here with that cement you got, so um where the block is yeah where that is right there so that's where the driveway is going to go to the bottom it's right there and then you've got the creek is over here and so we're going to put like a small retaining wall um in the, so they don't drive in the creek if they had a few too many. <laughs> so um, uh, we'll put a, a we'll, but that's where the driveway will go, and then it's a nice flat spot behind there. Oh, thank you. Others? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, for that oversight. All right. That, was, that was helpful. It was helpful. Thank, thank you. Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. First reading of ordinance number 15 2022. Anything further that uh, Mr. McMahon can help us with in this regard? Ms. Duncan. Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? No. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. All right, Council, let's uh, jump back over to um, where we were. <coughs> we have the first reading of ordinance number 18 2022. Uh, this is an ordinance to amend the City of Greer Historic Overlay District Zoning Map as allowed by Chapter 38, Article 3, Section 38 85 of the City of Greer Code of Ordinances. Mr. McMahon, information in that regard, sir? Thank you, Mayor and Council. So the Board of Architectural Review made a recommendation to add the Greer Mill site, which you can see here kind of as an aerial view of the property, as a local designated historic property. At that meeting in February, they kind of they met with the developer, talked with him, kind of went over what the project was going to look like towards the end of it, kind of revitalizing the mill. Um, so kind of with that recommendation, it goes to Planning Commission to actually amend the zoning ordinance, and Planning Commission did make a recommendation to amend it. Um, and sent that to council. The intent of this is to designate it as a local historic property. This will allow them to apply for special tax assessment for revitalization of the mill. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, kind of. Here is kind of the historic properties of like how everything was kind of built throughout the years in the mill. And this was the criteria that is required by BAR to make that recommendation to kind of see if it even fits into the historic property. For the purpose of discussion, I'll entertain a motion to receive 18-2022. And a second? Second. Or is that for discussion? What exactly is the perk they get from being designated a historic overlay, a historic place? So what it would do, it would allow them to come back to bar and request basically that special tax assessment. So the way that special tax, tax assessment works is it's a kind of a sliding scale. It's based on the assessed value of the property. Before or after completion? Before. So if it's valued at 500000 and they put in certain percent, they could get between zero to five years based on that percent. Then if it's 25 to 50%, it's five to 10 years with a max of 20 years of the assessment. So basically what it does is it freezes the tax rate at its current level. And you know, for the next 20 years, so the amount of work they're gonna put in this, they will meet the 20 year mark. So they would have 20 years of frozen taxes at that rate. They are also going through National Register with SHPO right now. Um, that process is ongoing. So they could get that designation as well. This is property tax? Yes, sir. Is it frozen for the city and the county? And Just the, the city. Uh -huh. So the county will reap a huge benefit from their development. Potentially. So will the school district. Potentially. In a historic.
historic overlay, does it not have to be contiguous or is this contiguous by some means? So within the or code of ordinance, it is allowed, BAR is allowed to designate individual property. So if it was a property outside of the district and it meets the requirements here in 38-81, they can recommend to designate that individual property. So it would not be in the historic overlay, it would just be designated on the zoning map as a historic property. Um, does the, is the developer the owner now? Yes, sir. I believe they are here tonight if you have any very specific questions for them on the development, but this is just for the zoning map amendment. Are there any perks they can get from the county? Do you know? That I do not know. Well, what, I, I read the list here and the only thing that I can see that says that may apply is has significant inherent character, interest, or value as part of the development or heritage of the community. That may apply. What makes this building, because from the front, it doesn't look historic. Um, bring up that uh, picture. I mean, you've got <coughs> the, the front, uh, it looks like it that was done in the 50s or the 60s and then you've got uh, on the left side is probably a tower for some freight elevator but then I know when you go all the way down on the right side on the shipping that's that's probably one of the last pieces that were made so Good. my my it's, it's it's not that I'm against the redevelopment don't don't get me wrong um, I think it'd be a, a great site I just um, uh, there's a couple of things that, that come up. One, and, and Riley just pointed it out, that, that we are the ones that would make the concession as far as freezing the tax. Now, what, Brandon, when did you say that that tax is frozen? So it would be frozen like once, if this is approved by council, it would go back to the Board of Architectural Review for that special tax assessment. So once that is approved by BAR, it's basically like a Pre-con meeting is basically what it is. They have two years to complete the project or to request an extension, but once that project is completed, it's frozen at that rate. Okay, so day one to end of two years, it's done. And then it's reassessed? So the taxes would be frozen before the reassessment, more than likely. So Because it would fall on the county reassessment. So it's going to be the, the tax rate that we would receive is based on what it's assessed at now. Correct. And you said for 20 years they would probably get that rate? Yes, sir. Can you flip back to that picture real quick? I, I think what's missing in this picture is, are all those windows that have been filled in here. You know, if, uh, in, like the project that was at Appalach where they had those large old windows, I think that's what's missing that makes this look not as historic in this so yeah, they, that yes, may sir. be part of their plan. Is well, what makes it historic? I mean, you know, we have a sign, historic downtown. Is it just because it's old? Well, I, mean, I think in this case, I think it's because that was the hub of that community. I mean, it's part of the history and the fabric of that community. So I think it's significant to, to that community in that area. And it's kind of like Victor Mill was similar to the Victor community. And then when that got torn down, that completely changed the complexion of the landscape down there. And now there's a... You know, there's a multifamily uh, apartment complex there, and it's not, it's not even close to what it once was. And so, um, but, so why don't then you step out and do the whole community, the whole Greer Mill Village, because that actually has more history and architecture that you can actually walk and see and feel that that came as a result. I mean, this is to me is it's, it's brick and mortar. You have arched windows because that's what they did at the time. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have, a, I have a tough time when things get, get, well, this is historic. And all it really means is it's old. Well, is there not a state statute where when you renovate an old mill, you get a tax break? I believe there are additional tax credits they could receive, not only through that or and through National Park Service. So they do plan on restoring it back to what the mill was originally. 
So they would have to comply with anything that National Park and SHPO requires as part of that redevelopment. That includes all the windows going back to the original look and everything. So what do we require as far as when we designate this, do we just say, okay, go ahead and <coughs> So once it's designated on the map, that's when it would go back to the Board of Occupation <coughs> Review with their entire plan set, showing what's going to be done on the elevation for the exterior of the building. Yep, but the Board of Architectural Review are not historians. They're just saying, yeah, it looks good, right? But for them, that, is that right? That's correct. You've got an architect on the committee, and it's made up of like different sure. professionals. No, no, but I, yeah, I, I understand. <coughs> By show of hand, is the um, a representative of the owner of the property with us this evening. Would you all like to address council? Uh, good evening. Uh, Cameron Gilstrap, 172 Ridgeland Drive, Greenville, South Carolina, 29601. Lawrence Black, 109 Antigua Way, Greer, South Carolina. So I guess to answer uh, or to start the dialogue about the historic value of Greer Mill, uh, it is old. Uh, it was built uh, beginning in 1909. Um, it is Greer's only surviving textile mill. Um, it was uh, the textile industry after reconstruction <coughs> that brought jobs to the upstate, and it is um, the textile mills that uh, brought forth the railways and uh, what is now Inland Port and the industrialization and the factories uh, that provide our jobs today. This was the first generation. BMW is the second generation. So uh, there is, um, even if you think it's an ugly building, there is a, a linkage to our economy, a very strong linkage. Um, it is a close to 300,000 square feet, the largest historical asset uh, in Greer's inventory, and it's also a majority of it. Um, if you've been out to other mills that have been renovated, they are beautiful. They are, um, they are also, um, they serve as um, a center point for a lot more development ecosystems, because um, you're not going to be able to build a building like this today. Um, it's a lot less expensive to do new construction of similar equipment, but you will never be able to use materials, the, the flooring, the woodwork, uh, the ceiling <coughs> lights. Um, they are, um, yeah. <coughs> when our garden style apartments are turned over in 20 or 30 years, this will still be standing. It's still standing now. You got um, pictures of all that? Be nice to see that. Yeah, we have, so um, we do have, we have to share um, all the work today. We have uh, the National Registry nomination. Uh, we're down in Columbia, ship out the week before last. We've been working closely with them for the last year. Uh, we have historical consultants on the team, historical consultants uh, working with the architects. So we have about 18 people working on this. So what other tax credits are you pursuing? Uh, there's historic, uh, federal, and local, or historic, uh, federal, and state, and then there's a textile. And textile, it's might be more familiar as far as abandoning um, building credits. Textiles is somewhat familiar, similar to that. It, it's not that I'm saying that <clears throat> the, the construction elements don't have value as far as something that's pleasing to the eye. It's not that I'm saying that, oh yeah, they, you can't build, what, you can't find the materials that are used. I'm not saying that. It's, it's, a, it's classifying it as historic. Yeah, okay, it, 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 uh, it moved here because labor was cheap. It built up, and then when labor got expensive, it left, and it devastated the economy. And now the automotive industry in the southeast, and I've said this numerous times, when labor gets too expensive, they're gone. 
And so are we going to say, well, the plant down here on 101, that's historic. You know, let's, let's, let's give in a, that, that kind of thing. I, I'm not, I just, we, we, Jay's opinion is we stamped too many things historic. Was there, you know, there wasn't anything, they, they you know, they, they, they were weaving, weaving and that's, that's, that's great. But um, I don't have a problem making it historic. I think it does hold a, a huge place in the history of Greer. And I'm not opposed to the renovation. I think I've seen in Greenville, I've seen several places where they've done it. My heartburn is with 20 years of no, of no expanded property taxes. It's, it's actually it's currently at 30 some odd thousand dollars. Um, uh, it's, I think a, a lot of these incentives are in place because uh, the renovation of these projects are not possible without it. Um, these sites like this, and, and this is always something I guess we should be considering for the factories we're, we're, we're currently building today. Same thing, what is the longer term effect? But with this, the longer term effect is this is, you know, it starts out as a $3 million hole in the ground with a lot of asbestos and lead based paint and PCBs. Um, they are, um, we had two other mills in the city, and they were DHEC sites for 10, 11, 12 years. Um, well, the Victor wasn't in the city. Well, it was, but it, was a, it was not on tax roll either. That's right. And, 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 and it was a 10-year process, 10, 12-year well, here, process. Here's the thing. That's right. The city did not have to spend dollars to service that. And I, and I think this is kind of, this is what my take is about we're freezing this from right now, 20 years out. Now, I don't know how many people can be housed in this one building, but it's a lot. And every time you put a group anywhere, I mean, that's, a, that's a community. It's going to be on one block, but it's a community. So we're going to have to have more police. Um, we'll be running a lot more fire and EMS calls. Um, they'll, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that, people don't realize about service when you provide it and it costs dollars. And, and so if you just start now and say, okay, well, we're, we're providing service for this. Well, there's nobody in there. The worst that could happen is it could burn and burn all the way down. And kill firemen. And, I was a councilman, uh, a councilman. I was a police officer. I know a lot about abandoned buildings. I've been shot at them. I've been, I, it, it, well, this, it, well, we never buildings had. like this are a burden. They well, anyway, they're, anyway they're, they're, they're not a burden, but but the, the way this one is. But but regardless, that's it's it's a uh, it's the cost to serve is the, the the city will be shouldering that burden. You say the property tax now was thirty six thousand. Correct. And uh, to clarify something, that it freezes the county level as well. It does. Yeah. So at hand is this ordinance to consider uh, a historic overlay district for the Greer Mill, um, re regardless of its historical prominence, which I agree that there is. I mean, this this was a game changer when it took place. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they uh, they produced uh, the material that made uniforms for the uh, armed services in either World War One or World War Two. I think there's some significance to the community that's around <coughs> it as well. Um, I think we've we've seen that um, because of the burden and the cost burden of uh, of undertaking a project like this, that uh, there generally needs to be some. Uh, incentive in that and I know that the, the city is, has uh, worked to offer some incentive uh, in that regard and um, I think I'm agreeable to, uh, to uh, extending that as well to other um, means of uh, getting this project off the ground. Others at this point, anything to add to our conversation in regards to ordinance number 18-2022? Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood. No. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Mr. Dumas. Yes. Mr. Bettis. 
You changed my mind. Yes. Miss Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Council, let's um, move to um, item seven. It's the first reading of the ordinance number 19 2022. This is an ordinance authorizing the conveyance of any and all interest in certain real, real property inside the city of Greer. Mr. Mayorman? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Um, just as happens from time to time, this time it happened in the, the 70s, the city um, was somehow found itself in possession of this piece of property over off of Canteen. Um, the uh, GCRA has identified the property and, and uh, would like to uh, continue to offer their, um, their services to the city by building uh, some diverse housing on that, on that piece of property. Um, my, my feeling is the staff's recommendation is the city deed that over to GCRA so they continue their efforts uh, investing in Greer. And the size of this property is what? Uh, this piece of property, and I'm, I apologize for not having enough, um, Nick. I, I told Nick I didn't need it, but um, evidently I did. I think the property itself is somewhere in the three-tenths of an acre, um, or excuse me, five, six, about six-tenths of an acre. I think that's what it is. I think they were they were going to try and get two homes on the parcel with the existing zoning. Okay. And, they, and so they're going to sell the homes? Just like they would through a normal program, yes, okay. sir. So we would get the program income. Yes, sir, okay. through the program okay. income. I had a motion to receive first reading of awards number 19-2022. So moved. Second. Four's up in discussion. Did we try to sell these lots? To my knowledge, no, sir. We have not tried to sell it at any time. But I, um, and, you know, you always run the, that ability, but I think given the neighborhood and the need for that housing, I, to me, this is a higher, better use. Other? <clears throat> Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? No. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Council has moved to the first and final reading of Resolution 7-2022. This is a resolution approving an agreement with Co-Transco of South Carolina Incorporated. Mr. Merriman? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Spartanburg County has advised the city that they will no longer be providing the um, engineering construction management services for our resurfacing program. Um, so we had reached out to uh, the legislative delegation in Greenville County and have requested that uh, for those projects that are within the municipal boundaries, that Co-Transco be able to um, uh, manage those projects through uh, GLDTC. Um, we find that to be actually a very efficient way of using um, our, our time and resources and certainly, certainly there. So staff therefore recommends that uh, we pass this resolution allowing Co-Transco to manage those projects as well. I heard the administrator in regards to resolution number 7-2022. I'll entertain a motion to receive. And a second. Second. Mr. Mayorman, was Spartanburg County providing those services or another entity providing those? Those services? Spartanburg County had provided those in the past, sir. If I'm not, Mike, that's, that's right, yes. And was there a charge for those services to us? Um, I can't answer that, Mike. Did they charge us, or is that through the program? Yeah. And our agreement with Co Transco will require us to compensate them in regards to a percentage of the work, or do, you, or do we know? This will come through our program and come through GLDTC, and I there imagine that yes, we will we would be charged a percentage of the work to be done. Are there no other companies like Cotransco? Oh yes, sir. I'm sure there are. Um, in this particular case, Cotransco just has uh, is GLDTC's uh, preferred contract manager, and we do all of our work with them already, so they're here. Oh, uh, there's not trust for <laughs> Understood. Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? No. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. No, he's not 
feeling good tonight. <laughs> uh, last item then on the, our regular scheduled um, <clears throat> meeting tonight is the purchase of two fire engines. Mr. Merriman, I believe you've got an explanation in regards to uh, that. Yes, sir. So ordinarily, um, <clears throat> we would never consider bringing a $1.4 million purchase to council uh, mid-budget year or even at this point in our budget year. However, um, given what we know is changing and volatile in uh, from everything from supply changes to the ability to to, uh, to get delivery on some of the things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have been informed that uh, the same truck that we had just ordered and hoped to have delivery of in August, Chief, is that right? Yeah. Um, is going to increase substantially um, to the tune of uh, about 7% as of May the 1st. Furthermore, the delivery time on those trucks are usually somewhere in the 16-month neighborhood. Now we're looking at uh, 22 months or so, hopefully a little quicker, but 22 months. So for all intents and purposes, um, we order these trucks today. We get them in 2024, which is effectively two budget years from now. Uh, we do know that our fleet um, has um, uh, going to have additional demands placed on it as we continue to grow. We also know that uh, the the fire fire apparatus itself is coming up a couple pieces in particular on their uh, service life the the end of their service life uh, so between uh, Chief Flowers' work on this and uh, David Seifert and I kind of pouring over this we do come with you to you with a recommendation to go ahead and get two of these trucks ordered for delivery uh, 2024 we are looking at a total of uh, one million four hundred forty four thousand um, dollars for both of those trucks. That will save us approximately uh, about 101, or excuse me, uh, if we prepay uh, now, we will pr we'll save somewhere in the neighborhood of $160,000 by moving forward on this now. On the recommendation of the administrator, I'll entertain a motion to receive. So moved. Uh, and a second. Second. Floor is open for discussion. <laughs> Mr. Merriman, can you remind us how how much we're pulling this forward potentially by doing this? Pulling when, forward. When, when had we anticipated? When we when would we have been? So well, it, it, to be honest with you, I would probably say that this year alone, in particular, would have had a truck in the budget from a recommendation standpoint. I would also say that at the rate we're going, another truck would have been in the following year's budget. So what we're really doing is front loading the two trucks. I would imagine we would have requested over the next two fiscal years at this time. Um, it's also important to note that um, that from a staff standpoint, again, uh, as we annex, as we move, as our stations, we reconsider the locations of stations, uh, that having the apparatus you know, in hand is, we don't want to get out too far in front of our skis with stations and staffing and not have the apparatus there to cover. I show a van as the owner or representative of the owner of the new trucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, a couple of things I wanted to add actually was, um, so this would be replacing two trucks that we currently have in our fleet that are already going to be coming up over the next couple of years. An additional consideration in this um, is that what we don't have it here showing as a savings, and there will be additional savings on top of that if you consider that if we push this out to two or three years from now, you're going to have additional increases. The industry as a whole is about 3 to 4 percent on average from year over year. But with this uh, volatility that we're currently seeing, I don't know what that would be. Like I said, right now we're, we're 5 percent over what our purchase of the current truck is, and they've got another 7 percent coming in May, which is unprecedented. That doesn't typically happen in the industry, but it's being driven by all of the supply chain issues, material issues, labor issues, and things like that. So what you don't see in the savings would be additional increases at a minimum, another 3 to 4 percent per year, probably more than that based off of how the inflation and everything else is going. What kind of a life are we getting out of a truck now? 20 years. Really? Yes, sir. Seems like we're approving a new fire truck every five years. Well, we, we also have several trucks that all were bought in a very short period of time. So are we running structural fires now, or do you foresee we will be to need new, two new trucks in two years? 
Uh, well, we, we have significant uh, maintenance and repair issues now on the trucks as they are getting closer to that 20 years. So, I mean, just keeping up with what we've got right now, this isn't increasing the size of our fleet. This is literally replacing units that were that are scheduled to come up in the next three to four years, or excuse me, two to three years. And what do you do with those when you retire? Well, we'll come back to uh, to council and ask if you want us to uh, surplus those on gov deals, or in some cases, um, it depends on the future growth that some of you are aware of. Um, we may have to take and use one of the trucks that we've got now, which will be the newest reserve truck would be a 2014. So we still have some significant life left in that truck that we're using right now as a frontline apparatus that would roll into a reserve truck. And then some of the older trucks that we're replacing, we will come to you with you know, some recommendations on how to surplus those. And Mr. Bettis, just to follow up on that as well, um, if you'll recall through our the ISO process and our prestigious uh, one, uh, part of that is having the adequate uh, apparatus and equipment, not only on in the active fleet, but as reserves as well. Um, but to your point about running the number of structure fires, <clears throat> that's just a matter of mathematics is because as we continue to grow as a city and we continue to uh, add rooftops, both uh, commercial uh, rooftops as well as residential, uh, we will by necessity need those uh, larger pieces of apparatus. I think to your point, and one of the things that uh, we're real proud of is that QRV program that we're not running them on the calls, the medical calls in particular that we had in the past. We're being much more judicious about what's getting um, moving, when they're, when it gets moving, and for what reason it gets moving. Others? We have a, a truck on order, and this will be ordering two new. Two new, yes, sir. And we've, we've got, just so we under, you know, we've got four engines total right now. Two of those are what we call frontline, and they're one of each of the main stations. Um, with this, we will have three new trucks that will allow us to have a uh, primary unit out of three stations. So we've already paid for one, one truck? Not one of the two that we're asking you to consider tonight. We have one that's currently on order in this budget year that you, you guys approved in, in this current budget year. So we're getting three trucks? Yes, sir. But we're getting one, and then in two years we're getting two. Yeah, it'd be two years. We just need to. We need in order to save the money we need on trucks. We know we're going to need to buy. If we buy them now, we will save a substantial amount of money because the the, the cost increases are just uncontrollable. Mr. Airwood? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. <laughs> Council, this, this concludes our regularly scheduled meeting. There are two items in executive session this evening. I'll entertain a motion that we go into executive session uh, for those matters. Mr. I'd like to make a motion to enter into executive session to discuss two economic development matters, uh, one pertaining to Project Keystone, the other to Project Lineout, and that's allowed by state statute, section 30-470A5. Comes as a motion, I hear a second. Second. Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Mr. Dumas. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Ms. Albert. Yes. Mayor Danner. Yes. We thank you for joining us this evening. We will remain here for executive session. We will ask at your leisure that you clear the council chambers. Thank you. All right, council in executive session, we have considered two economic development matters. We've taken no action in regards to either one. And I'll entertain a motion we come out of executive session. And a second. Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Mr. Dumas. Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes.